Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the program, the long reach of Henry Kissinger's shadow and why are we still living under it? We talk with professor and author Greg Grandin about his new book. Then later we take a look at the U.S. supported coup in Honduras in 2009. All that and a few words from me on impunity and learning from the Guatemalans. It's all coming up. Welcome to our program. Is the empire rising or falling? Our next guest is just the person to ask. Greg Grandin has been examining empire in all its forms across seven books, including his latest, Kissinger's Shadow. A professor of history at New York University and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Grandin writes on U.S. foreign policy, Latin America, genocide and human rights. He also served as a consultant to the United Nations Truth Commission on Guatemala. Greg, welcome back to the program. Glad to have you. Hi, Laura. So this new book has a very spooky cover, and the full <laughs> title is Kissinger's Shadow, The Long Reach of America's Most Controversial Statesman. First, I've got to ask you, I think of you as the Latin America guy. Um, why Kissinger? I mean, it's been 40 years since he's been in office. How did he get your attention? Well, Kissinger obviously had a lot to do with Latin America. We could talk about the specifics, but Chile, Operation Condor, Argentina, the list goes on. I, I just thought it would, it, he's 92 years old, and he's in the middle of this rehabilitation and embrace by both parties, by the Democrats, by Hillary Clinton, by Samantha Power. You know, obviously by the Republicans, by conservatives. He has a major biography coming out by a very uh, well-known, distinguished, and conservative historian. And I just thought that um, I thought that the left uh, needed to kind of return and think about Kissinger not just as a war criminal. Mm -hmm. That's necessary, but not sufficient. That I think that Kissinger's life, looking at his long career, not so much his life, but his career, allows us to actually move beyond individuals and and link. The, think about the broad strokes mm. of American, you know, linking Cambodia and Vietnam to today's endless war, today's national security state. So how, where do you see his shadow? Where? Well, I see it everywhere. <laughs> I, see <laughs> I see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. I, I think Kissinger, I, I just, let me say, I don't think that Kissinger is singularly responsible for the, for the permutation of the national security state into this monstrosity that it's become, but I think that um, looking at his life illustrates it, shines lights on it. And I do think that he was he does have a consequential le legacy in, in, in what he did. I think there's, there's ways in which you can go back to Cambodia, we can go back to Vietnam, and you can go back to many of the things that he did in the late 1960s and 1970s, first as for um, Nixon's National Security Advisor, and then Secretary of State, and then yeah. continuing on with Gerald Ford, as both in some ways, what I argue is that he hastens the, the breakup of the old national security state mm -hmm. that comes out of World War II and presides over the early years of the Cold War based on elite consensus, bipartisanship, and public support. And even as he's accelerating the breakup of that with his actions in Cambodia and Vietnam and Watergate, he's helping to reconstruct mm. a new national security state, able to move on, and, and that's the shadow. Because you say that in 1970 you would have thought the national security state, as we then knew it, was sort of suffering a major defeat and perhaps even on its decline, yeah. far from it. Yeah, well, all, all the post-Vietnam post regulations that the Congress imposed and the judiciary and the public and a dissenting public and a skeptical public, a skeptical press uh, put on the executive branch uh, their ability to wage, wage covert operations and illegal wars or legal wars. And um, we look back now and we can see how those regulations were just in some ways a blip, that in some ways the whole first Reagan and then neoconservative project has been to figure out ways to overcome those, the, the, not just the regulations mm. specifically, but the broader skepticism, public skepticism and lack of will to war. And, and Kissinger, I think you could find the early, early steps of that mm. bypass or workaround in Kissinger's policy. Now you go specifically back to the bombing of Cambodia and Laos. Uh, Remind people of this generation what that was, why it's so significant to specifically the story you're just talking about, and, and how many lives were lost. 
Well, just to answer the last question first, Ben Kien, an historian of Cambodia at Yale, estimates conservatively that 100,000 civilians were killed in the bombing, the illegal bombing, and mostly covert and secret bombing. Uh, the way it worked was that Kissinger conspired with Nixon to derail peace talks in 1968 prior to Nixon's election. This, I mean, other historians have dealt with this in detail, um, and it's pretty, it's pretty, it's confirmed. There's, there's little doubt that Kissinger and Nixon were involved in this, as well as a host of other people. That wound up prolonging the Vietnam War, just to get a Nixon election for no reason. The, right. the war was ended in 73 on the same terms it could have been ended on 68. Nixon appoints Kissinger not just national security advisor, but m makes him the most powerful national security advisor in history. Yeah. Takes power away from the State Department, takes power away from the Department of Defense. And um, one of the things that Nixon and Kissinger do is that they need to end the war, that they Right. just prolonged and and they need to force North Vietnam to the bargaining table and to make concessions so they can have peace with honor and they can't start bombing North Vietnam right away for a host of other regions so they start bombing Cambodia as a way of showing its resolve to North Vietnam so it's a, almost a perfect expression of how you know escalation you know we have to escalate in order to de-escalate there's a certain kind of and um, and between 1969 and 1970, late 1970, that bombing was completely covert and illegal. And it was illegal throughout the whole, but um, it was covert. They figured out a whole very complicated way of carrying it out so the press wouldn't know about it, so the Congress wouldn't know about it. Um, Kissinger's rationale for doing that when he was called on when he was called out on it at different moments in 70, 71, 72 was always the same, was that we have we're doing it to defend the U.S. soldiers were stopping the supply lines of North Vietnam, I mean, but arguments that were far out of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Basically, we have to deny sanctuary to America's en enemies, even if that includes bombing neutral countries we're not at war with. That was an argument considered completely fringe in late 1960s, early 1970s, to the point where many of Kissinger's conservative colleagues broke with him. Fast forward to 2014, and it is Obama's rationale for the drone warfare program, for the global counterinsurgency. And in so, fact, Henry Kissinger argues, I mean, he defends himself yeah, now yeah. by saying, well, look at what they're doing now. Yeah. I was doing just the same. You, you, you mentioned that in the book, that he kind of uses this circular argument. Well, they're doing it. So it's, it's a okay. perfect expression of the circularity of American militarism. Where Kissinger, in his last, his last book, was World Order, and on his book tour, he, most most reporters gave him a pass. Nobody nobody asked him any questions about Cambodia or Chile. One did on NPR on the takeaway, um, and uh, his response was called out on Chile. He pointed to Libya and Syria and said, "Well, this is what Obama is doing." Called out in Cambodia, he he uh, he pointed to the drone war prep program. What, now, it's fascinating because what's interesting about that is it, it Kissinger is invoking today's endless wars to justify what he did 40 years ago. But of course, the irony is that what he did 40 years ago made possible today's mm. endless wars. Well, let's talk about his motivation. You write that in 1968, everything he did after being appointed National Security Advisor, every policy that he advocated was in the interest of the United States. I think you write more or less verbatim, also turned out to be in the interests of Henry Kissinger. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> how so? And how, does, how do you see that trajectory from office to out his out of office work with the consulting firm Kissinger Associates. Well, there was for starting with sixty eight, starting with the way the derailment of the peace talks in Paris over Vietnam led to the catap him being catapulted into one of the most powerful positions in the world. There was a fusion, I think, of self and 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 mm -hmm. and society in his mind. Um, I think that I try to use that to speak to the the ultimate hollowness of his. Kissinger is often held up as somebody who believes in purpose, that America needs to know what it's, not just that it can do something, but why it's doing mm -hmm. something. This is the kind of ba basis of his critique of whatever president is in power, that you know they, they know what they're doing, but they don't know why they're doing it. And, and, but if you actually kind of dig out what he means by that, there's nothing there. It's, he's got, there's a circularity to his, to his reasoning that power creates purpose, purpose is needed to create power. And this speaks to one of the arguments in the book that Kissinger is not a realist. He's mm -hmm. actually an idealist. He mm -hmm. actually is a kind of will to power 
philosopher of the deed. He doesn't believe, and this goes back to his training as a, you know, as a, as a philosopher back at Harvard and, 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 and some of his earlier education, but it runs through much of his writings mm -hmm. up until his latest book is that he doesn't really, he believes that reality exists, but he doesn't believe that we have access to reality mm -hmm. other than the actions that we take in order to make meaning. And the reason why that's important is he's often mistaken as a realist and he's often juxtaposed at, uh, opposed to the kind of adventurism and the idealism mm. of the neocons who drove us into Iraq thinking that America was so powerful we could reshape the Middle East, we could reshape the world, we could reshape the terrain. And, um, and it is true that Kissinger and the neocons had political conflicts, particularly when Kissinger was in the Ford administration dealing with the fallout from Vietnam and loss of, in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. but. Kissinger, one of the arguments is that he actually enables and makes possible the yeah. neoconservatives. I mean, he does talk a lot about the um, need to project American potency yeah. around the world. I thought of Helen Caldicott's reference to missile envy. It's like, do we have a potency problem in this country? Maybe that's one motivation. But I am interested in the nuts and bolts, dollars and cents motivations behind this guy, because he's ended up with some of the most valuable clients in the world, we think. Um, we certainly know he defended Union Carbide, uh, uh, the, the polluters of, of Bhopal. Yeah, uh, we know he's supported the privatization of some of utilities across Latin America. The 9-11 widows wouldn't allow him to be appointed ch chair of that 9-11 committee because they thought he was too tight to Saudi Arabia. We still don't know who his client list no, is, No, right? it's a private consultancy, so that he doesn't have, I mean, he, did, he gave up being chair of the 9-11 committee rather than, show, rather than reveal his Kissinger Associates client list, and as a, a Republican senator, I can't recall his name, who said that that client list is the most sought after document in all of Washington. Before they Hillary often, Clinton's They emails. often, even often some secure safe room in the bowels of the Pentagon where they would look at the list in order to make sure there was no conflict of interest, but Kissinger, Kissinger Associates wouldn't reveal it. So it, a lot of the stuff about what Kissinger Associates did it's all it's just it's yeah. it's completely it's completely unknown we do know that a lot of a lot of um uh, uh advisors that work with kissinger associates were involved in the privatization of, of latin american industries we do know that he's has deep ties in russia and china and in, in in saudi arabia um but a lot of it we just we just don't know the details but i think just to step back yeah. because the danger of kissinger is that he he could we could take him as an agent of the deep state and we could dive down the rabbit hole trying to make the connections and, and not really step back yeah. and see the bigger picture um is that it, it's a per again we see as secretary of state as national security advisor he, he helps accelerate the terror in latin america that is the precondition for the privatization. And then as a private citizen, his Kissinger Associates benefits off the privatization. So again, it's that it's 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 another dimension of the of the perpetual motion machine of American expansion and militarism. And just very quickly, his role in the Middle East, helping to bring us the peaceful and safe Middle East that we have today. <laughs> yeah. The role is deep and, and insidious in ways that in ways that people don't even I mean, he's the person who pumped up the Shah, elevated the Shah which uh, George Ball, a, a, a foreign, foreign uh, service career um, uh, official said was an act of folly. Yeah. And a lot of people you know, see that as, as leading to the radicalization of Iranian society. He's the one who allowed Iran and then Saudi Arabia buy whatever they want, basically using petrodollars in order to feed into the defense industry, yeah. which was hard hit after the Vietnam wind down. Um, and, uh, and then even beyond that, he, after, after leaving office, he supported every one of the neocons push and he supported the first Gulf invasion. In some ways, that whole sh yeah. spectacular lighting up Kuwait with night vision, techno power that was that first Gulf War was a perfect inversion of mm -hmm. Cambodia. Cambodia was kept secret. Nobody saw it. The first, the first Gulf War, there was months of public debate getting the public pumped up and ready to go in. And then there was all of yeah. the on-air commentary as if the reporters were turned into sports commentaries, football, you know. And, and so that was a, that was a, yeah. a perfect flowering or, or realization of Kissingerism. And he was one of those commentators. He was one of those guys. Shamefully. He's everywhere. He's on every, every... I heard him interviewed about his book. And at the end of the interview on public radio, I think it was Scott Simon said, would you be comfortable with a, a Hillary Clinton? presidency yeah. and he said I would be very comfortable with a Hillary Clinton presidency <laughs> one of the most frightening things I've heard <laughs> um, 
Where do we stand in terms of this guy's influence today? And what does that tell us about Hillary Clinton? In addition to, as you said, she calls him her friend. She says she consults with him, et cetera. Right. Well, there's two ways, I think, of thinking about Kissinger's rehabilitation. One, just to step back, it, Bill Clinton started the democratic embrace of, 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 of um, Henry Kissinger. And partly that was because Kissinger was instrumental in getting NAFTA passed. Under H George H.W. Bush, Kissinger helped negotiate NAFTA with Carlos Salinas, the president of Mexico. And then after Clinton became president, he helped Clinton get it through Congress. It was Kissinger who came up with the idea of bringing all the ex-presidents for mm. the signing, you know, behind Bill Clinton. So there was already, the Clintons were already, um, already beginning the embrace. Hillary Clinton protested the invasion of Cambodia back when she was at Yale. Now she wrote a review of, of, of I, I, I'm two, there's two things. I think one is this, this, this real interest that we only have a glimpse of, you know, where like in Plato's clay, we can only get shadows of what the, what the real interest is. But also I think things are so bad and the U.S. foreign policy is, is so bankrupt and so, so paralyzed and not knowing what to do. You know, mm -hmm. ISIS, or, I mean, you know, they don't, you know, that, that Clinton, it's almost pure affect, right? I mean, to sidle up next to I mean, Kissinger. We don't know what to do, so we'll call on Henry. Well, because he he, he invokes gravitas yeah. and purpose. Even though my point is that there is no yeah. the there there after the purpose, but he 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 symbolizes that he symbolizes seriousness. Thanks so much, Greg Randon. The latest is Kissinger's Shadow. You can find a link to this book and all Greg's previous books and interviews on this program at our website. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Journalist Jesse Friesen has a new film about the 2009 coup in Honduras, and it's a powerful look at popular resistance that's not been reported in the U.S. media. Here's an excerpt. por cuidarle la espalda a los que están dentro. Hacemos lo necesario de cuidarlos como hermanos y protegerlos pues, de unos a otros, cuidarlos. Sí. Sí, es lo, la obligación de vigilante en el portón. Y es lo que nosotros vamos buscando, la hermandad. Es lo que vamos buscando nosotros, el, el compañerismo. Entonces por eso nosotros hemos sentido un cambio libre, pues, libre. Es lo primero, cuando se forman las comunidades, por ejemplo, dicen vamos a dejar una área para cancha de fútbol, otra para escuela, iglesia y todo eso, ¿verdad? pero lo primero es la cancha. De... Mucha atención habitantes de esta zona. En esta unidad de sonido se compra hierro, cobre, aluminio, botes de plástico, bronce, ollas viejas, latas de sardina, baterías de carro, hierro sólido. Y también aquí en esta unidad de sonido le vendemos montongo para la sabrosísima sopa. A buen precio todo. Venga, acérquese. Todo bien. Está bueno. En esta comunidad es donde, donde vivimos, ¿verdad? El asentamiento de la Concepción. Como nueva generación hemos investigado cómo estas tierras han sido explotadas y fueron quitadas fraudulentamente. No sé qué pasó ahí exactamente y quizás como que no, no se pararon y ahí lo, había un retén militar. A Juan Galindo ya lo sacaron. Iba... Íbamos para Trujillo y ahí lo dejaron, lo, lo dejaron ir. 
At 28 years of age, Wan Chinchia is the youngest member of Muka's leadership. One of his responsibilities is documenting attacks against members of his community. un campesino muerto en esta hora de la mañana donde fue arrastrado por sicario de Miguel Facusé que hoy Será que le pegaron primero el tiro en el ojo, lo quebraron, lo torturaron. Como que lo arrastraron y está en carro. Aquí lo hacemos en, en un día, ya lo hacemos a veces en una semana con la empresa privada. Todo el proyecto que tenemos ahorita de MUCA es lo más mejor que tenemos aquí. En esta. Tenemos bastantes beneficios porque tenemos ahorita el proyecto de unas casas donde vivir, agua potable y, y luz, y mientras que con la empresa privada no tenés ningún beneficio. Y como no tenés vacas, hombre, la leche es de tu patrón. That was an excerpt from Resistencia, the fight for the Aguan Valley, by filmmaker Jesse Freeston. There's more information at our website. If the Guatemalans can send their war criminals to jail, why are ours still walking around? It just so happened that I was reading our guest Greg Grandin's new biography of Henry Kissinger while the news was breaking in Guatemala. After 30 years of civil war and many years since in which killers have transitioned seamlessly from being murderers to making money and staying in power, Guatemalans said no more. For months this year, they've held mass protests demanding prosecution in a corruption scheme that rigged trade deals for kickbacks and robbed one of Latin America's poorest nations of millions of dollars. This August, hundreds of thousands of people from all sectors of Guatemala's very divided society surrounded the National Palace and refused to leave until Congress voted to strip President Perez Molina of immunity from prosecution. The Congress did it on fear of being on the wrong side of an angry populace just weeks before a national election. What sent President Perez Molina and a slew of his cronies to jail was a mountain of financial and banking evidence. But what kept people in the streets, people say, was Molina's history in the military. As a young commander, he led an army unit in a particularly brutal region that saw tens of thousands of people slaughtered mostly by the military, in the 30-year civil war. Impunity corrodes democracy, people said. We can't even call ourselves a democracy when we let oligarchs evade the rule of law. Molina was just settling into his jail cell this September as Chileans marked the 42nd anniversary of the coup that Henry Kissinger helped to mastermind. Kissinger's gotten away with murder there, as well as in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, Southern Africa, Indonesia and Iran. As Greg Grandin points out, his shadow extends over today's devastated Middle East, and he's still walking around free and smug at 92. 
As one Guatemalan columnist put it, Guatemalans finally lost their patience. What the heck explains ours? Write to me. Tell me what you think. Laura at GritTV.org. And thanks. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Andrew Coburn discusses what's wrong with the way the U.S. fights war. George Bush, let's hear it for George Bush. Um, he was actually quite restrained in his use of deployment of drone assassination because he preferred to capture people and torture them. Later in the program, we look at the story of Fahd Ghazi. Fahd Ghazi was one of the first men to arrive at Guantanamo. He was just a few months past his high school graduation. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk with Jacobin writer Peter Fraze and musician Boots Riley about the better worlds they say are possible. That what we have thought of as capitalism, based primarily on the exploitation of wage labor to make profit, is going to turn into something else. This year will be the year that we do what we've been waiting for. This year will be the year that we stop knocking and kick down that door. It's going to be